Okay, great. Thank you for being here with me. Um, my first question is, has isolation during the pandemic changed your approach to acting? Or are you aware of any particular aspects of stage performance? Um, I, I think the there has been, for me at least, because I've also been teaching online a lot and, and kind of trying to coach students through the uh, online platform, I think we've taken for granted, at least I have, um, the abilities that were afforded on stage. And I feel like a lot of the time Zoom is considered somehow a hindrance to the things that we were able to do on stage. But I think it's it's actually just highlighted a couple of things like that we just took for granted um, and that came easier to us. And so a lot of the leaning in that we have to do on Zoom, we don't have to do as much in person, but I think we've, we've tended to overlook some of those things. So um, I think just like basic listening, responding and taking in of information from our scene partners and the people on stage with us is, is something that has been kind of brought to the forefront for me as, as a teacher, but also as a performer as well. I learn through my students all the time. So in that space of Zoom, um, do you see that being closer in style to film acting or stage acting, or is it something different entirely? I think it's something in between. Um, I feel like camera work is a little bit more specific, right? You There is movement, but it isn't as free um, anymore, maybe, um, or with particular styles and genres. Um, but uh, Zoom is sort of, you have a box, but it isn't as small as you think it is because it has a lot of depth as well. Um, and then with audio, you can actually step out of frame and still be heard. Whereas on camera, if you're, it's very rare that we we have scenes where one person spends a, a bit of time off, um, off camera. And so I think it is something in between, which is what makes it so interesting, I think, for, for someone who typically works on stage to then be on this weird camera online platform and then step back and do stage work. Have you been conscious at all of differences in how audiences might perceive Zoom acting as opposed to our traditional stage acting um, as we see it or film acting? Yeah, I think a lot of, at least a lot of my active friends dread um, watching Zoom plays, even though a lot of times we just show up to support our friends, our Zoom readings. Um, it's just so easy in a world like today where we've got social media and our phones are so readily available. Um, it's so easy to be distracted by the things that you can do on your laptop while you kind of have the Zoom screen on the one side. Um, so I, I don't think I don't think the experiences are similar for an audience member. For us as performers, you learn so much more by having to use this platform as your main communication point with your fellow actor and your scene partner. But for audiences, being there in person, seeing the actor live, is, there's no replace, uh, replacement for that. And I think very soon, as, as soon as it's safe to, I think we're just gonna get off Zoom completely. Um, and going off of the audience reaction, have you seen a change in audience reception, not only in the COVID pandemic era, but before that, do you see a difference in how audiences have received what we would consider non-traditional Shakespeare performance, um, mm -hmm. all gender cast performances, for example? Um, has that in any way, have you noticed a shift at all? I think audiences and creatives in general are a lot more open to diverse and different casting with Shakespeare, even casting directors know. Um, I mean, even with myself, I'm not typically cast in the United States just because I, I look a little different from the way that I sound and, and color, color casting here is it something of its own. Um, so a lot of times I'm put in by my own representation into Shakespeare work because they know that it's such a, um, it's so big that you can, it could handle, um, and so classic that it could handle any kind of different casting. 
Um, I don't think audiences are shocked anymore, but also audience etiquette is one that has also changed drastically. So depending on, I think it also culturally is kind of different, but um, you sometimes can't tell what an audience is thinking just because we've been taught to be quiet in a theater and laugh maybe kind of uh, at a low volume unless everybody else is laughing. Um, so there's, there's kind of a limit to how much you can actually receive as an actor on stage in a place like maybe New York versus where I'm from in Zambia, where um, I think we're encouraged as audience members to even respond or ask questions um, to the people who are on the stage. Um, and going off of that, um, I was wondering, you talk about the maybe more malleable or openness of Shakespearean work in particular. Is there anything from that that you believe should be applied to theater writ large as opposed to specifically Shakespearean theater or classical theater? Is there any aspect that you think we can learn from within Shakespearean theater relating to that kind of openness? Yeah, I mean, I think this is something that the casting world in general is trying to lean towards colorblind casting, which can also be kind of problematic because you can't have a role um, and this was my training as well. A lot of times I was given roles that were written for uh, typically middle-aged white women. And so I was stepping into uh, a background or um, like a playing field that I wasn't particularly familiar with from my own lived experience, especially not in the United States. Um, so there's the danger of saying, um, come in, play this role, but there's nothing else that we're gonna change about it. And then of course you're expected to kind of speak in a way that you don't normally or relate to people in a way that isn't, doesn't match up with your lived experience. But definitely I think the openness of the casting that we see in Shakespeare is something that we actually see in the real world. Um, we see diverse families, we see diverse friend groups, and then all of a sudden when it's casting for TV, film, TV is getting quite diverse now, when it's casting for theater and, and film, um, we don't see that anymore and it's not at all representative of the real world that we live in. Um, I think we do need that broadness in casting in theater. Um, but I think that it needs to be done mindfully just so that our actors don't feel like they're betraying themselves when they're putting on these performances. Mm -hmm. And especially in television, I know we've seen a significant shift in casting, especially since last summer and the yeah. kind of racial reckoning that's been happening in the States. Has that at all transitioned into theater or has theater, has theater in any way undergone changed during or since uh, the events of last summer? I definitely, I, I really think so. I think it's just been a shame that because of the pandemic, we haven't been able to really see those effects just yet. But I mean, the public is about to put up um, an African, a West African version of uh, the Merry Wives of Windsor, which is going to be so interesting that it's done in a West African dialect. It's kind of being um, adapted by an American slash Nigerian um, playwright, contemporary playwright who's gone in and actually altered the language so that that dialect really does live in the text. So that's very interesting. And there are a lot of other off-Broadway and Broadway houses that are changing their what would be their normal programming so that it does reflect what's happening in the world. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and in regards to the changes in, um, specifically with that West African example that you gave, um, when you take on a character, do you view that character as fundamentally Black, or is the identity of that character in some way separate from your personal identity as an artist? Hmm, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I have my own different understanding of character, which is, I mean, unless it's based off of a, a person who's living or who has lived, um, it's, it's just words on a page. And so by speaking those words, all of a sudden I become the person that everybody sees and attributes these um, um, characteristics to. So without even trying to, just by, by saying those words, I do embody this particular person. So there is there is no way to, to run away from who you actually are, just because that's all you're, you're ever able to bring to a role is just your experiences. We're limited to, to just this. Um, but I don't, I think because of my own upbringing, I don't um, think of myself 
as I think of myself more as, as culturally bound to places and to nationalities, but not so much to color. And I don't want to limit, um, I don't want to limit myself in that way either. So it's more about experiences and just nationality. Um, I don't know if that fully answered your question. <laughs> For sure, no, it, it, it absolutely does. Um, and speaking of lived experience, when you begin um, a new play, do you typically engage in dramaturgical work, um, especially if this is a play that has a specific historical setting that is not typical of one of the plays or of one of you know if it's elizabethan as well um in shakespeare uh no definitely of course i mean i can't walk into even an audition room and not know what i'm saying uh which is so easy with shakespeare so even if you don't know one word or one particular phrase in a, a 20 line monologue, it's gonna stand out and the listeners, the, the audience hears that right away. And definitely auditioners and directors pick up on that. Um, so yeah, I think research is, goes right along with beginning to learn lines. I think as soon as I receive text, I have to start looking up stuff um, and, and looking into historical background as well. And maybe even looking up specific productions so that if there's, Maybe uh, not that as an original way to say Shakespeare or right way to say Shakespeare, but kind of looking at past performances just to get an idea and understanding of what of what these words said out loud and alive sounds like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, is there a particular play, um, be it Shakespearean or otherwise, which you connect to, especially in regards to how it relates? relates to racial or gender identity? Oh, that's a good question. Well, I'm sure there's Othello, but I think there may be less, Shakespeare is also so, um, it can be applied to so many different things because it's so universal and also vast in subject matter. Um, I recently, in my training um, worked on Julius Caesar and kind of placed it in the, in the African context. And I know that BBC did a really great production of that as well um, and kind of investigated um, African political power structures by studying Julius Caesar and placing it that way. So, I mean, that was one cool example. I think that Shakespeare could explore racial issues. If there's a little bit of tweaking, all of a sudden those kinds, the words highlight anything if placed in the right context. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And going into the point about um, political power in Africa, with kind of the climate, the political climate we're living in, do you believe that in some ways the political ramifications of Shakespeare's work is more profound or clear? Um, and do you at all believe that your own work has become more political to your to yourself or to the audience? I, I think that if a director is is willing to be bold enough to make those direct um, um, those direct uh, references, then definitely. I think Shakespeare's work can help us highlight a lot of what's going on right now. Um, and I think it just it just takes a bunch of artists who are fearless enough to make those direct connections and to present that to an audience. Um, I, for one, um, have always kind of enjoyed putting up work and creating work of my own that um, is that has social commentary, um, which is a little bit challenging because I, I live in a place that when I'm not in New York, uh, when I'm back home in Zambia, that it has a little bit of um, not necessarily censorship, but one can't go, we can't draw the kinds of connections, political connections as openly as an artist in the United States might be able to. So there's a little bit of, uh, of, of care that we have to take when we do that kind of work. No, but I, I, I'm always been a fan of, of political work and socially relevant work. Do you have any thoughts on um, how oftentimes we now see certain companies removing uh, segments if they're going to be performing Shakespeare because of its dated element or its problematic aspects? Do you have any thoughts on um, artists, directors doing that in particular? 
Hmm. I, um, I think because the work is, has proven to be timeless and because the copies are available everywhere and anywhere. Um, I don't think it's a bastardization of the work anymore just because you one could access the original copy at any time. And then it just becomes, I think, a director's or a creative's way of personalizing for the company that they have. Um, I think that was done recently in production. I was working on a uh, check of where somebody was supposed to touch my hair. Yelena was supposed to touch my hair as Sonia. And because it didn't work because of the casting racially, that got changed. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people or a lot of um, Russians might not have agreed with that. But I think it, the, what was more important was having the, the actors in the room feel comfortable and feel proud of the work that they were about to present. And so I think that's the same thing with Shakespeare is now that we're opening doors and now that we have diverse um, creatives on the other side of the desk and then we have um, actors in the room, I think it's very important to honor first the people who are in the space, then the text. I don't think, I mean, Shakespeare is dead. Um, he doesn't care. <laughs> Um, is there a particular Shakespeare play or role that you've had a special attachment to, but have never been able to perform on stage or on film? Yeah, I think I in, weirdly would enjoy playing either Hamlet or um, um, Cassius from Julius Caesar. And are there ideas in Shakespearean theater and in Shakespeare's writing that you think are especially potent in our current political era that you think have real potential to be mined uh, today by artists? I don't think any of his ideas have stopped being relevant, which is a little alarming. Um, he talks about all the same things that we're still struggling with. There's power dynamics, there's uh, infidelity, there's um, lovers being uh, unable to kind of be connected, which in some way, some form of segregation as well, or some people uh, um, for family issues or where, um, social status issues and wealth aren't able to interact with the people that they do want to interact with. All of those things still stand. Um, and I mean, that's what makes Shakespeare so great is that we still are able to relate wholeheartedly to the themes that he was uh, exploring in his plays. But I think it's also a little, it's a little worrying that we haven't made any progress as, as humanity since, since Shakespeare's time. Mm -hmm. Do you have a background at all in classical theater other than Shakespeare? Um, a little bit of um, ancient Greek um, plays and that kind of text. Um, I think a little bit more so than normal just because I'm half Greek as well. Um, but in terms of training programs, no, I think what was really pushed was Shakespeare and then the rest was modern contemporary a little further back. But uh, yeah, just, just that. Mm -hmm. Um, and my final question is, if you could see one specific change made to classical theater, Shakespearean theater, or theater in general, what what change would that be? I think we need to continue to diversify, but not in the surface level sense of the of the word or the idea. We need to have different sizes, bodies, just sizes of bodies, um, in, in, of course, shades, right? Um, shades of people, nationalities, um, different types of people playing certain roles, right? If there's a role where we're casting a, a king or we're casting a queen, it shouldn't be the typical, um, Cele beautiful, celebrated, widely celebrated woman or man as, as those roles. So I think that we need to diversify in a deeper sense and then also allow people to, to meet Shakespeare where he's at. So they need a, we need to allow actors to really bring a full, a full sense of themselves into their work. Um, I'm, I've been fortunate enough to do quite a bit of work at the public and each time I go, their casting department is, is brilliant and they let me and their creatives let me speak the way I normally do. So I, I never really have to make accent shifts. And so that feels wonderful to me to be able to bring my own bicultural background into the role that I'm playing. But I think that we need to see a lot more than that because all of us are quite complex um, and all of us have got 
different ways that we um, express femininity and masculinity, a combination of both blah, 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 gender expression. And so I think we need to see diverse roles in that sense, not in the sense that, all right, I'm casting a black person, someone from Japan, and then a bunch of white Americans. Yeah. <laughs> Great, thank you so much.